Hi, my name is Tony Van Veen, CEO of Dismakers. Welcome to the third video in Dismakers series about music copyrights and royalties. If you haven't seen the previous videos, click on the link in the description below this video window and that'll get you to the very first video. In that video, I discussed the two basic rights to a song, the sound recording and the composition, also frequently called the publishing. There are many royalties paid out for owning either or both of those rights, and I'll be discussing those in this video series. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing what royalties and payments you are entitled to if you own and exploit the sound recording. So who owns the sound recording exactly? Well, if you're an independent artist and you paid to record your own music, you are the owner. If you're on a record label, then typically the label owns the sound recording. That part is pretty straightforward. Historically, on any album or single, the bulk of the monies from that album or single, from the exploitation of that album or single, are paid to the owner of the sound recording. Those payments typically go directly from the platform where the product is sold to the owner. Um, no middleman is typically required with the possible exception of a distributor. So, okay, here are the ways that sound recording is monetized today. Let's start with streaming royalties. Nowadays, as everybody knows, most music is consumed through streaming. And the bulk of streaming royalties, probably between 80 and 85%, go to the owner of the sound recording. The remaining 15 to 20% are paid through a performance rights organization, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, for the public performance and to the owner of the publishing. So if you distribute your music to the streaming sites through any one of the big D digital distributors, CD Baby, DistroKid, TuneCore, and you have signed up for their standard basic distribution service, you will collect about 80 to 85% of the available streaming royalties. Number two, physical product. In the days of physical product, and many of us still sell physical product, when a distributor sold a CD to a retailer, they typically owed the label around $7 or so to buy that CD from them. And of that $7, maybe about a dollar or so, give or take, uh, would uh, go towards the publishing and the rest of the royalties were really to the owner of the sound recording, to the label. Uh, or if you're an independent artist, to the artist. All right, neighboring rights is the next category. Now neighboring rights are complicated and I will address them separately in another video. But suffice it to say that in the US, neighboring rights royalties are generated from play of your music on non-terrestrial radio. That is satellite radio like Sirius XM or internet radio like Pandora or iHeartRadio. And these neighboring rights royalties are paid to the owners of the sound recording and to the artists. Next up, YouTube payments. YouTube rights and royalties are also really complicated and merit their own video, or, or heck, maybe even a vid their own video series by themselves. Suffice it to say that when YouTube knows that your music is being used in a video, whether it's your own or somebody else's video, they will frequently be able to run ads on that video, and part of the monies that those ads generate will go to the owner of the sound recording. Okay, music downloads, yes, there are still about 17 people, I think, left in the world who pay for music downloads. And just like with physical media, the bulk of the dollars that iTunes pays to the artist or the label are for the ownership of the sound recording. All right, let's talk a little bit about social media royalties. So the monetization of music rights via social media, and specifically Facebook and Instagram, is still in its infancy. And the exact formulas are, are they're still being figured out. We, we don't really know exactly how that's gonna all end up and all gonna be tracked. However, some distributors like CD Baby can already deliver your content to these social platforms so that users can place them in their store. So when a user does this, royalty revenue will go to the owner 
of the sound recording. And then there's sync licensing fee. When your music is placed in a visual medium, a TV, a commercial, a video game, uh, a movie, uh, it is synchronized or synced to the video content. And when a music supervisor for such video content wants to license your music, usually through a middleman, a sync library of some kind, they typically pay an upfront fee to the sound recording owner for that recording. And then there's a couple of uses that could happen if you're an independent artist, but they are fairly uncommon unless you're well established. And those uses are samples, people sampling your music, and remixes. In both cases, the owner of the sound recording needs to give approval and you get to negotiate a fee for the use of your recording. So there you have it. Owning the sound recording allows you to drive revenue from quite a few uses. And for any release, it generates the bulk of revenues from that release. Now that said, most of the uses I just mentioned also generate publishing royalties for the publisher or for the songwriter. And typically the publishing royalty owed for any one sale or one stream or one view or one performance is smaller than the sound recording royalty fee. The power of owning the composition, the publishing, however, is that many people can record your song and then you can get your mechanical royalties paid out over all those sales, all those plays, all those views and performances from the many artists recording your song. I will be discussing mechanical royalties in my next video. And I will see you then.